We will continue with our study of the Gospel of Matthew. By God's grace, we have covered the first ten chapters by now. It has been a long journey. And now into chapter 11. And so please turn your Bibles to Matthew 11, verses 1 to 6. Matthew 11, verses 1 to 6. Are you all ready? Let's uh, pay attention to the reading of the scriptures. Matthew 11, verse 1. And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison, the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now, dear friends, One of our greatest joy in this church has been the opportunity that God has been giving to us to read and study God's Word in a systematic way. It helps us to see the Word of God progressively being revealed uh, to us through the pages of the Holy Scriptures. Uh, The Bible has a unique way of teaching the truth to us. It's not by uh, just telling you something all of a sudden uh, and then you read a Bible verse which you feel like reading and then you get all that God wants to tell you. In fact, when you start to read the Bible in a pick and choose kind of approach, you are going to be misled most of the time. You can do that if you have a complete knowledge of the scripture. You you are very well grounded. And then when you read a particular verse, you know the context of it. And you can quite quickly understand. But if you do not know the context of the scriptures, that means you have not studied the Bible in a systematic way through the book. You pick a verse, you read it, you tend to interpret it according to whatever you feel. You are not guided by the entire context of the scriptures. It's extremely dangerous. And it is one reason why we pay attention to teach you, whether in our fellowship groups uh, or on Sunday or in other uh, uh, meetings, uh, book studies and passages, so that you may see the progression of thought and understand the scripture well. And I hope you are not anyway... Uh, distracted or disappointed that I'm not running through the Gospel of Matthew uh, and quickly trying to finish it and go to another book. We may take three or four years to finish this book, but that's fine. As long as you understand thoroughly what the Scripture says. You know, one advantage of it is this. If you know the Gospel of Matthew pretty well, it is much easier when you read Mark, Luke, and John. Because it's going to be Repetition of stories in some instances and also the thoughts that you've learned about the life of Christ will help you further when you read the other Gospels. And it will also help you when you go into the book of Acts and Romans and other epistles. And so the Bible is built upon one another and they are interlocked, interlinked, and we have to see the connections all the time. Keep that in mind. 
Don't take the attitude of some who occasionally read a Bible verse and they feel like re reading and then expect all the blessings of God to come upon them. It's not that way. All right, so with that small introduction, let me get into the passage. The major focus, I believe, of this passage that we read is in the final verse that Jesus said. Blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. In other words, do not be offended in me. Do not be offended in me. Now just try and recall what we have been learning in Matthew 10. The reason why I said this, because in the very first verse of chapter 11, we read, and it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples. So he is telling us that he just finished, Christ just finished commanding his disciples. And what was he commanding his disciples? Well, all of us have been studying very intently chapter 10 for more than two months. And what have we learned? If you remember, it was a chapter where Matthew records for us how Jesus called his 12 disciples and commissioned them to go and preach the gospel in the cities of Israel. Take a look at chapter 10 and you read verse 7. And Jesus said to the disciples there, As ye go, preach, saying the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he told them to go and preach. And as they go from city to city, and the kingdom of heaven must be preached. Now, it is important for you to understand also that Jesus did not say that when you go and preach the gospel, everything will be all right with you. Things will not go wrong. I will be with you and no problem will ever come. You know, Jesus also said in the preceding verse, that's verse 6 of chapter 10, that I'm sending you uh, like sheep among wolves, right? Uh, in fact, uh, that was a big challenge they had. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, not in the preceding verse. The following verses would tell you that. Jesus said that, uh, that he's going to send them into the midst of wolves. Uh, in other words, people will be extremely aggressive toward those who preach Christ. And many will not be happy to have you. Jesus didn't say, I'm sending, sending you among sheep. He said, you will be like sheep going into a pack of wolves. And that's the experience. And then we studied verse by verse in which Jesus has portrayed the, the, the wrath of the ungodly world that will be pouring upon the preachers. They would, up, they would be very annoyed that the message of Jesus Christ is preached. Uh, but the people will be happy to hear them saying, well, I will heal you or I will pray for you. That people don't mind. They will gather together to have the miracles for their benefit. But the moment the truth will be preached, there will be all sorts of problems. They will accuse them falsely. They will drag them into synagogue. They will charge them. They will put them in prison. They will flog them. And even Jesus said, if somebody were to believe on their message, even those people who believe will be suffering. They will be suffering all kinds of betrayal by their own families. And Jesus even said in chapter 10 that I did not come to bring peace but a sword. In other words, the father will turn against the son or the son will turn against the father. There will be so many problems even within families because of Jesus. When somebody believes in Christ and decides to follow him, families can be divided. And even that happens today. Even today it happens, isn't it? Some of us do experience such hatred. Some of our children do not want to help us or support us or want to have anything to do with us because we tell them of Jesus. Uh, some of our parents have abandoned us long ago. Uh, some siblings have kept away from us. They have nothing to do with us because we talk to them about Jesus. You see, if you are a silent Christian, 
and nobody will have a problem. You don't tell them about your Christian faith. You don't take any decision as to uh, the fact that you're a Christian. You go to work. They ask you to lie. You lie. Uh, they have carnal pleasures, getting drunk or singing worldly songs and watching wicked movies. You go with them. They are happy with you. They will never say anything. But the moment you say these things are wrong and this is not pleasing to God, they start get irritating, irritated and started to trouble you. And so... A lot of Christians today has taken an attitude of silent Christianity. Silence. They don't mind to come to church, but they want to hear the message, which of course most churches preach today. If you come to Jesus, all your troubles will go. All the problems will go. You will have no more physical struggles. Money will just come to your pocket. People are going to praise you. You're going to have promotion. Come, pastor is going to pray for your promotion. Your, your wealth, your health, boom. But seldom anybody preaches like Christ. Telling people, if you follow me, you're going to experience the worst worst. Uh, thing that you ever feared in your life. You'll be unattended to. You'll be lonely. You'll be persecuted. Now, dear friends, Jesus was not just a talker. And interestingly, the Holy Spirit had a specific reason why in chapter 11, this particular incident that happened when John the baptizer sent his two disciples to talk to Jesus. And the conversation went on to the point that Jesus said to the disciples of John, go back and tell John that, look, don't get offended in me. You know why? After telling the disciples that trouble will come your way when you go into the cities, Jesus himself went around preaching. And the first person who came to him is one who is not counted among the twelve apostles, but one who admired Christ with such passion even before any of these disciples were ever called to his side. And his name is John the Baptizer. He was a whom, one whom God has prepared to prepare the way for Christ. He is the one who baptized Christ and introduced him to the world and saying, Behold the Lamb of God. He was indeed a gospel preacher with great passion. All of Judea and Jerusalem would come out of the city and listen to him. And he was not having a comfortable uh, auditorium like this. You know, I always feel very amused by some churches that had advertised. There was one church in Tampines. Don't want to tell you the name. I think you figure out very quickly. They're often in news. Mega church. They used to advertise behind SBS buses in the early 2000, uh, 2001, 2002, like that. I often see them be because I lived in, in Tampines. And they will write, come to our church. And the main title is this, a great place to worship. Can you imagine? The main reason why they advertise, because they got a fantastic auditorium. Well, we have a good one, but I don't think I will ever advertise, come, because we have a nice auditorium. But, you know, they have some points underneath. You know, they bullet them, and they write there, comfortable seats. Really, I'm not kidding. Tall man orchestra. Friendly ushers. See, what are the reasons you must go to church? And at the end, anointed preaching and healing service. Preaching is small, the healing is very big. This is how they advertise. People crowd around that kind of churches because it's like a performance. You know, you like going to watch orchestra uh, playing music for you. It's entertainment. John the baptizer had no 
auditorium for anybody. He preached in the wilderness. <coughs> I think we are too comfortable to be good in our service for God sometimes. Too comfortable. We are not always tested. In Singapore, because of religious freedom, we are really becoming um, a rather untested material as far as Christian faith is concerned. The very first preacher of Jesus Christ had nothing going for him in this world. He didn't have an address. Where is John? Somewhere in the Judean wilderness. Go. When you are there, you can hear him shouting. Repent! Not welcome. Come, what is your felt need? Let me minister to you. That's not the question. The first thing is, repent! Oh, you hear that sound? That's John. Let's go there. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. This man was a powerful preacher. He did not live by the size of the congregation or size of the auditorium or by the orchestra that will play music. Some preachers cannot preach now without music at the background. Mm. Yes, the Lord is speaking. Dum, dum, dum. You know, they, have the, they need the drums, they need the electric guitar screaming out and then they feel the spirit moving. In the wilderness, there was nothing of that sort. It's pure preaching. Passionate preaching. Preaching the truth of God. Not for the pleasure of the people, but for the glory of God. It sometimes created great terror in the hearts of the people until they crumble, melt before God and say, Lord, I surrender. But the preacher's life is never easy. You know what happened to John? Exactly whatever the Lord has told the disciples in chapter 10 had already been the experience of John by now. So there is a great reason why the Spirit of God brings up this incident where John now sent people to Christ to tell him, Lord, are you the real Messiah? Now, i tell you why. Such a question was asked. But let's take note of this. If you go back to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, we did come across this statement before. Uh, whether you have took note of it, I do not know. Matthew chapter 4, and look at verse 12. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Jesus himself avoided the Judean area, the southern area of Israel, because he knew the mood of the people is no good. He moved up to Galilee. That's the northern part of Israel. John's ministry was in the southern part of Israel, in the Judean area. Jesus said to himself, this is not a place to stay now. Persecution is coming. Of course, Jesus came back. But at that moment, when they arrested John and cast into prison, there was so much animosity against all those who were friends of John. Remember, John was so preoccupied with Christ. Even his disciples were told to follow Jesus, right? Jesus said, I mean, John said, Behold the Lamb of God, Andrew, and his brother Peter. All were John the Baptist's disciples. They all followed him. Now, look, go to Luke's Gospel, where you have this account uh, where... We are told how he was arrested and put in prison. So if you can turn to Luke chapter 7.
verse 18 onwards, you will see the account. Uh, sorry, let me just get myself right. Okay. Sorry, I'm getting that reference wrong all of a sudden. Okay, um, in, I think it's Luke who have recorded it. Yes, I'm sorry, chapter 3, not 7. Luke chapter 3, verse 19. <clears throat> Luke 7 is another reference which we will look at later. I'm sorry. Luke 3, verse 19. But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother, Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added at this above all, that he shut up John in prison. So why was he put in prison? Because John the baptizer was a faithful preacher. He did not entertain any man, no matter how powerful the person is. If the person is doing something wicked, he would tell them, and tell them, repent. You remember, I told you a while ago, one of the major messages of John was to tell the people to repent that the king may now have his way into your heart. An unrepentant heart will never have Jesus coming into their heart. If you come here and is unwilling to repent of the sins that you are engaging in, and still without unrepentance say, I believe in Jesus, you will not have Jesus in your heart. The way John prepared the people to receive Christ the King, who is the King of the Kingdom of Heaven, was by telling them to repent. Repent for the Kingdom of God is at hand. That's how he preached. If you want the Kingdom to reign in your heart, if you want to be part of the Kingdom of Christ, then repent. And so he told Herod the Tetrarch, even though he was a king, a very cruel person, whose wickedness was well known, was confronted by John because Herod took his brother's wife. His brother's name was Philip, and his wife Herodias was stolen away by him. What a wicked thing to happen in a family. It's so wicked that John spoke against it. And of course, Herod was angry. And that's not the only thing that John rebuked him. If you pay attention to Luke 3, 9, it says, For all the evils which Herod had done, John did not mince his word. You know, one of the problems of modern preaching is that they try to be like the politicians, say only things that are politically correct. You know. So if there is adultery in the church, the church will not receive the rebuke for that. There can be elders who can continue to be elders uh, even after committing an elder uh, because the, uh, the pastors and all the rest of the leaders say, shh, let's don't talk about it. It's very embarrassing. Shh, let's quietly sweep it under the carpet. And so we have churches filled with fornication. Young people come to church, worship the Lord, and then go together and sleep together before marriage, and then come back next Sunday, hallelujah, they're in the church choir, they're everywhere, and the pastors say nothing about it. Do you know something about Singapore churches? Most of the youths live in fornication, and they feel no guilt about it. And I want to tell something. Your, your singing, no matter how beautiful it is, it will not bring you to heaven. Neither will you find the redemption that is in Christ. Pornography. And now, churches, like Church of England, is now talking about a loving same-sex marriage. They already have bishops who are homosexuals. What is happening to the church? Where's the voice against sin? Majority of the churches only, uh, is only interested in money and big crowd so they can have their pockets filled with things. Just a communal gathering. The other day I was reading an article published by some evangelical pastors in America. And they said we must be, 
very pastorally concerned about our flock. And so if we have gays and lesbians, we must first think how to pastorally minister to them. And to pastorally minister to them means we must feel for them, understand and appreciate the way they are, and include them in the church. Wickedness. That's not pastoral. These are false shepherds. You do not bring a soul to heaven by entertaining them in their sins. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And when John stood up and raised his voice against the most powerful person in that area, he was not afraid. He knew he came to exalt Christ. Not another king. His king was Jesus, not Herod. And he wanted it to be clear. He has, is a faithful, loyal servant of Jesus Christ. The king of righteousness. And so, as a faithful servant of the king of righteousness, he stood and rebuked all the evils that Herod committed. How many of you are daring enough in your places of work, in your places of living, when something wicked is done, you will say, that is wrong. Or you keep quiet. I know of a brother in our midst who was asked by his company to entertain Japanese customers or clients of the company by taking them for a meal in the evening and bring them for a happy time. In nightclubs, he said, no, not me. He had, he had to resign. They said, sorry, that's your j job requirement. He said, no, I can bring them for dinner, but I'm not going to go with them to karaoke sessions and arrange girls for them. That's not my job. Oh, they offered good price, I mean, good salary for him. He said goodbye to him, them and took a much lesser pay. I know of a sister in our midst who was posted in a very good multinational company and she was asked to arrange lesbian gatherings in Singapore. She resigned immediately. She told them, no, can you put me in another area? I don't want to do this. Then they tried to persuade her she left that place because she can't stay there. What sort of Christian are you? What sort of Christian are you? I am tested so deeply. I was speaking to a group of youths for the last two days. I'm pretty tired. Maybe you can feel in my voice. I've already preached about 15 sermons in the last four days, four to five days. But when I was speaking to the children, I was so, so passionate about telling them because the theme they gave them was vows of the 21st century. And I said, there's no point telling you what is going on in the world. It's getting worse. But I want to tell you what's happening in the church. I mean, the world can get as wicked as it can be. But the problem now is not the world gets wicked. We in the church are getting wicked. The scripture says in the last days, many false prophets will come. Many will become self-lovers. There will be a form of godliness that deny the power thereof. And we are seeing it. I said this. Many of you young boys and girls will have friends who will invite you for the same-sex marriage. Or maybe your brother or sister. Just last week I happened to read on internet the New York Times that has a very funny article I I don't want to go into the details, but it says, my brother is pregnant. You see, they are trying to catch our attention. They are trying to reshape our thinking. This has to do with transgender operations that are being done. This girl was born as, I mean, of course, as a girl. 
but now she's a boy. And so the other, the other sibling who is a boy had to now say, this is my brother, because she changed her sex. But again, her reproductive organs are still there. And so they come up with a statement. Now my brother is pregnant. That's how the world is changing. Christians, you have to make some very serious decisions in these days. And I said this to the young people. If my children become a homosexual and invite me for their marriage, or my grandchildren, if God gives me a long life to live, I don't know what nonsense is going to come in the next 10, 20 years' time. And they say, Grandpa, I'm going to get married to my friend. He is Mr. So-and-so. You get a shock of your life. Say, okay, Daddy will come. Granddad will come. No. God forbid. They are my children. They are my grandchildren. But I will not be with them. I will be with Christ. I want to publicly say it. Because I want to have a moral authority that, because I'm a servant of Christ. And that is to be exercised in my home, in my church, and the society I live in. I'm not here to make money. If, because I preach like this, if the society reject me, cast me into prison, I better be ready. Whether it's fornication or adultery or homosexuality or or pride and arrogance, whatever be the sin, we have to stand up with Christ. Otherwise, we are false teachers and preachers. And so Jesus told the disciples in chapter 10, go preach the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And as you go preaching, you will have all sorts of extreme Difficult experiences. Extremely difficult experiences. They will hate you. Not only that. They will drag you into court. They will accuse you as though you are evil people. You know, because I preach against homosexuality. Now, very soon you will hear, Pastor Koshi is a bigot. Pastor Koshi is homophobic. Pastor Koshi is extremist. Oh, get him out. He, he, he. Causes people to hate one another. No. We don't preach this. Because we hate them. Because we love their souls. We love their souls enough to tell them. What destroys their souls. And what would put them out of heaven. And I tell you. We cannot be preachers without moral courage. And that comes from our union with Christ, our love for Christ. And we know he has given his life, not that we may continue in sin, that we may be delivered from sin. This we must believe. My dear friends, if you want to sit among the elite of this world, like King Herod, and John the baptizer would be very great, right? I think many of you would like if suddenly there's a news. Pastor Koshi is invited to White House to share a meal with President Obama. Tomorrow the photo comes in, uh, in, in, in Straits Times and everywhere. The only pastor in Singapore who was given the privilege of sitting with Obama. Well, I will go, but he may not have meal with me. I tell you why. At the moment I get in, I will say, you have sinned against God by allowing same-sex marriage in your country. I will say that to him. I'm sure he will boot me out. By the way, he won't even invite me. Couldn't be bothered about me. Who am I? But I'm just telling you, this is not why I'm a preacher. Not to sit with the powerful of this world, but even to confront them with the mighty sword of God's word. The preaching of the gospel. And so there was John the baptizer. 
thrown into prison. From chapter 4 of Matthew until now, we have not taken into account the fact that John has been where? In the prison. And what was he doing? Languishing in that prison. What was going through his mind? Read on. Come back to our text, please. Matthew 11. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. He was still thinking about Jesus. He was not telling his disciples to go and see Herod and plead his case that he will be released. He was not maneuvering uh, among the politicians and religiously powerful people and say, please plead for me. Uh, please uh, open the doors of the prison. You know, uh, hey Jews, I'm one of your prophets. I'm your prophet. God sent me. Why do you allow Herod to put me in the prison? No such thing. He is least concerned about any other person on earth, but most concerned about Christ. He was overwhelmed with the, with the, with the thought of Christ. And his ears were attuned to hear any news that would come through that prison walls. If anybody would visit him, he only want to hear about Jesus Christ. And he heard it carefully. He considered the works of Christ, not just work of Christ in a general sense, but in plural. That is to say, he really paid attention to what people say that Jesus did, whether it's uh, miracles of healing the lame, the blind, the deaf, or raising the dead, and all sorts of amazing things Jesus did and preached. He paid attention to it. And interestingly, you know, though we noticed in the early chapters of the Gospel of John that some of his disciples left him for good and followed Jesus. Some didn't. You know, there was one conversation that is recorded by John in his gospel, which we did look at it before, where some of the Jews uh, came and argued with John's uh, disciples and Jesus' disciples as well uh, about whose baptism uh, is more uh, powerful as to uh, how, to, uh, how to be sanctified and who would sanctify you and all that. And they came to Jesus. And then they said to Jesus, are you not concerned? I'm sorry, they came to John, John the baptizer, and said, are you not concerned that a lot of people are now following Christ? When all those Jews came to John the baptizer and told him that, look, all the people that were following you are now following after Jesus. John said, I'm not the bridegroom. I'm the friend of the bridegroom. And my joy is that people will go after Christ. He is the bridegroom. It's his wedding. He is the king. I'm only his friend. And then he said, I must decrease. He must increase. John was full of Christ. And so he was happy that people who once came to him are no more with him. He is happy that his congregation is getting smaller and smaller, which is not the case today. We all like to say our congregation is growing bigger and bigger. Of course, it should grow bigger and bigger if people are coming to Christ. Not because they are coming to Pastor Koshi. Or any pastor. And every pastor must remember his preaching has to always lead people to Christ. Yes, if I preach Christ, you will come to me. I know that. But even more importantly, you don't come to me because I am witty, I am funny, I am good looking, I am wealthy. No, 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 no. You should come because I follow Christ. That's all. And John was very mindful of it. And in that process, whatever he had to undertake, he would do it. Do you realize something? 
Jesus is also showing the same attitude right here. After teaching the disciples to go and preach, he sent them out to preach, and then he went alone to preach. Look at chapter 11, verse 1. We were looking at it, right? And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. He went alone. He was not very concerned that disciples would always stay with me, with him. I'm not saying Jesus didn't care for them, but he was willing to preach alone while he sent the rest of his disciples to preach. You see, the idea of preaching is not just gathering people around me all the time. And I've said this always. If God has led any of our preachers to go elsewhere to preach, let them go. And that's why when Reverend Paul Cheng, who was a deacon here, felt the Lord's call to Bethel, I said, brother, you go. And when you go, trust in God and do the work. When Joseph Poon was called to go to Perth to preach in BPCWA, I said, brother, you go. And uh, brother Andrew Coe, who is now looking after the youths, was approached by one pastor to see whether he would go to Sydney to preach there. And I, when Andrew came to me and said, Pastor, what should I do? I said, it's up to you. If the Lord leads you, you go. If the Lord says you stay, you stay. It doesn't matter. Well, he prayed and the Lord, uh, Lord directed him to stay here. So he didn't go yet. Maybe in the future, who knows. But you know, the thing about preaching is that the Lord is not trying to keep us all into one place. Like John the baptizer, if we have young people coming up to preach, it must be our joy that they will go and preach more and bring more souls to Christ. We are not trying to show off anything. So this mega church mentality of having a lot of people under one roof, just for the self-praise, is not the way it should be. I'm not against having thousands of people gathering. If it is God's will, let it be. But we don't try to set up an empire of our own. The providence may split us before we realize. The Jerusalem church had thousands of people being saved and added, and at the persecution came, and they went all over preaching the gospel. The point that we must always remember, in Christ's kingdom, we never work to secure anything for ourselves, but we work to declare Christ. And whatever the providence would lead us to, whether it's by persecution or by divine appointment, we must commit in those areas, according to his timing, to do the preaching of Christ. And John was happy to do it. He let his disciples go, but some still remained. And I have a feeling John was not very happy these guys are still sticking around. Because... You know, it's a waste of time if you were to look at it. Because John cannot do any ministry inside the prison. What are these guys doing there? Shouldn't they go and follow Christ? John already told them many times. He is the Lamb of God. Go to him. He is the one who taketh away the sin of the world. But these disciples are still sticking with John. Well, maybe they have not fully accepted Christ. Though John did. Maybe there are a lot of discussion going on in that prison between John and his disciples. That's what I think. I think John didn't send these people because he had doubts. But these disciples have doubts. In that prison cell where John was lying, he was not at all happy that these guys, though they have the freedom to move out, would not follow Christ. So he sent them and said, you go and ask a question and learn from the mouth of the Savior. You go. I tell you what the question you want to ask. I tell you the question you should ask. What is that? Verse 3. Art thou he that should come? Or do we look for another? What a question. You think John would ask that question? He has repeatedly, clearly, unashamedly, powerfully preached to the people and said, Behold the Lamb of God. 
I'm not even worthy to unloose a shoe. He was absolutely clear beyond doubt that Jesus who came to him to be baptized is Christ. He doesn't need any more testimony. He heard the voice from heaven. This is my beloved son. You know I am well pleased. He saw the Holy Spirit coming like a dove upon Christ. He had heaven's own witness. He had the voice of the Father speaking ministering to him. And there are also clear evidence in the Gospel of John that the Holy Spirit himself indicated to John that the one who is coming to him is Jesus. You know, they never met before the baptism of Jesus. Though they were relatives, they never met. You know why? Because when Jesus was born, because of Herod's plot to kill Christ, the, the angel said to Joseph, take the baby and the mother and go away, Egypt. And they went to Egypt. After that king died, when they returned, they didn't come and stay in Judean area. They went straight from Egypt up north to Nazareth. And Jesus grew up in Nazareth. And by the time Jesus came into the public ministry, John was out in the wilderness. Remember, the first meeting was in the wilderness. Though they were relatives, they never met. And it was the Holy Spirit who indicated to him, Jesus in the crowd was the Son of God. And so he was able to point his finger to Christ and say, Behold the Lamb of God. So there was divine witness in his heart, divine witness from heaven like a thunder saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then there was the Holy Spirit coming upon Christ. All these were heard and witnessed by John. Do you think John is in doubt? I don't think so. Well, one might think maybe the years of uh, rejection and now the persecution might have caused some doubt in John. I still cannot think that's the case. But I am very convicted that it is for the benefit of those disciples who are still lingering around him that he wants them to go and ask this question. Of course, in the process, it is possible that he also gets strengthened further with the answers that Christ will provide. You know, I am a preacher. I love to preach. And I love to teach, but that doesn't mean I don't love to be ministered to. Do not think I'm, I resist teaching. I love to be taught. And even when my students, whom I taught theology, come around and preach, I love to sit there like a baby wanting to be fed. And I pray for my fellow preachers who are formerly my students, who are now collaborating with me. I pray to the Lord that they will be great preachers because that's going to benefit me. Even though some of the things are things that I know I'm convicted of, but to hear from another witness with the passion with which I have preached or even with better passion than I am is going to trigger me to greater love for Christ. And I know, and being a preacher, I don't question John's motive right now in sending the disciples. I think it is that studious heart, that heart that not only want to learn, but also want to see others are being strengthened in the Lord. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful experience. And so, here comes the disciples to Christ with that question. And they asked, Are thou he that should come? Or do we look for another? Now, how do they know there's somebody to come? Of course, the scripture is full of evidence of that, isn't it? The Old Testament is full of messianic prophecies. Uh, And uh, all those prophecies teach us that God has prepared his son to come to be our savior. So many verses. Genesis 3.15 Her seed is a reference to Christ. And then you have the promise that God gave to Abraham that I will bless them that bless thee and cause him that curse, sorry, curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. 
there was a reference to Christ, through whom all nations shall be saved. And then you have in chapter 49 of Genesis, this prediction about Messiah, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. It's talking about a king that shall come in the tribe of Judah, so that the kingship will be forever in Israel. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, as a reference to Christ, the giver of peace. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. You can read through, whether it's in Numbers or Deuteronomy or Psalms or Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Daniel or Hosea or Joel. Everywhere you see Jesus being predicted as coming to be the Savior. And John was the final witness in that string of prophets of the Old Testament who would introduce Christ to the world. Let me tell you. If Abraham was alive when Jesus came, it, was, it would have been his great delight to point to Christ and say, This is the seed that Father in heaven promised to me. In him all nations shall be blessed. If Isaiah was there, he would say, Oh, this is the virgin son about whom I prophesied. That's in Isaiah 7.14. If it is Micah, the prophet who was there, he would say, Oh, this is the one whom, about, about whom I prophesied that he will be born in Bethlehem. I am telling you, it would have been the delight of every prophet of the Old Testament to introduce Christ to the world if they were alive. And everyone who read the scriptures with faith were like that Simeon and Anna who waited for Christ's appearance in the temple. When he was born. And so here the two disciples. Comes with such. Such knowledge of the Old Testament prediction. That God will send a savior. And they come and say. Art thou. The one who should be coming. Or should we wait for another. Now that seems to be. A problem isn't it. The second half of that question. Or do we look for another? Now, they didn't say, well, my master John says whether he should look for someone else. But it says whether we. So you can see the actual doubt didn't originate in John's heart. It comes from these people who were around John. So John said, you go find out. I've been telling you all the time who Jesus was. That is the Lamb of God. Now you go and ask. So they said, should we look for another? I think that's the biggest clue why this question was brought from John to them for the sake of these disciples who have not yet fully believed or convicted. And now come to verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go! And show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. Next verse. And the lame walk. The, lep the lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he. Whosoever shall not be offended in me. Very interesting. I, I know there are people who have misread verse 4. Because they say, you see, Jesus said, go to John and say this. Yeah, that's true. Jesus said, go to John and say these things. Not because John is unsure. <laughs> I think there is a need for us to read things carefully with the understanding of the context. If you take this passage in the larger context of the witness of the Gospels, Mark, I mean, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you cannot come to a conclusion that John is a man who was never sure about Christ. You have to have the complete understanding. John had no doubt about Christ. You remember, God says he sent him to prepare the way for Christ. So he cannot be a doubter. It's impossible. All the testimony of the Gospels and the Old Testament prediction in Isaiah about John the baptizer tells me one thing. John was never unsure, unsure about Christ. He knew who Christ was. 
And so I will not accept any suggestion that any of these things here refer to John as being a doubtful person. But let me show you what exactly Jesus is trying to say to these disciples who came. You, because you came from John, now you can tell John what you have seen about me. You have been hearing from John all the time. And that was not enough for you. Why not now you go and tell John with the same conviction with John has talked about me to you. Because you have come to me. You have seen me. You have heard. Now you be my witnesses. That's the point. It's not trying to fix the doubt of John. He is trying to fix the doubt that existed in these disciples. You know, my dear friends, remember how I started my message. If you are a Christian, you cannot be a silent Christian. You must confess Jesus Christ with your mouth. Paul said that in Romans 10. Believe in your heart and confess him to be the Lord with your mouth. So if you are shy to say a word for Jesus, if you can't even say with confidence that Jesus Christ is the only Savior whom God has sent to deliver me, then what is your faith? You are on a shaky ground. Your heart is not sure. The Bible does not teach us secret discipleship. If there is anyone who is secretly following him, he must come out of his hiding. And our area of testifying is not just uh, our home or our comfortable group that we, we are used to. You got to leave your comfortable group and go into all the world and preach the gospel. These disciples cannot stand around John for long. Soon John will be beheaded. When we come to, I believe it's chapter 14 of Matthew, we are going to read that he is going to be beheaded. And soon these disciples will not have the leadership of John the baptizer. They will be on their own. And they better start now. If they truly follow John, they have to follow Christ. Because John's only job was to let, lead people to Christ. Never to keep to himself. So John, by sending these two disciples to Jesus, were hoping and praying and wishing that they will now be transformed by Christ to be his disciples, to be his witnesses. And so, let's see this. Jesus told them specifically, you, verse 4, Show John again those things which ye do hear and see. Dear friends, have you tasted Jesus in your heart? You know, you can go from here. I went to church. Oh, why do you go to, ch why do you go to church? Church, you know, um, you know, people go to church for, for worship now. Worship who? Jesus. Oh, what do you think about Jesus? Well, I think about Jesus, whatever uh, the pastor preached. Now. And what did the pastor preach? Pastor preached whatever in the Bible. Now. So what is in the Bible? Uh, you read. Uh, you know, there are people of all kind coming to church. They can't even say a word for Jesus. So embarrassing. None of you should be like that. After sitting under me for 25 years of my preaching here, and you still cannot explain to people who Jesus is. What is wrong with you? I tell you what was wrong. You have not been to Jesus. You have been to Gethsemane BP Church. You have been to Pastor Koshi's lectures, but you have not been to Christ. Have you been in fellowship with Jesus Christ? Have you on your own sought your Savior? Have you communed with Him? Have you told Him your problems and seek His help in your life? If your heart has not received him, if you have 
not open the door of your heart for him to come and sup with you, your doubts will never go. And you have not tasted who he is. <clears throat> there are some people in our congregation who are very good in finding out where to go and eat food. So if I want to treat somebody, uh, uh, you know, I don't have to Google. Sometimes I Google, I don't, I don't get confused sometimes. You know, they say, go here, go there, and all that. And, but you see, they tell you it's good food, but I never taste it, you know. Once I went to a place to eat, I tell you, I would never go there. Though Google said five, five stars, you know. It's so horrible. But I trust some of our people here who have been to so many places, they, they are food lovers, not to, not to blame them, but they love good food, they know how to taste. And if, they, if I can call them and say, hey, brother, I have so and so to treat, or I like a particular kind of food for tonight, I want to bring my friend. Oh, pastor, I would like to recommend this. Thank you very much. You know why I trust them? Because they know. They know food, they know what good food is, and where can they find it? They tasted it, so I trust them, right? I won't call my father in India and check with him where to go for dinner tonight with somebody in Singapore. That would be foolish. You can never be a witness for Christ until you taste your Lord and Savior. Oh, taste that the Lord is good. Let me tell you, my dear brethren, do not just come to the church and stick around me or the preachers here or the elders here. It will not be sufficient. It will not be sufficient. Go to Jesus. He welcomes you and says, come unto me. I will give you rest. How wonderful is our Savior. Jesus didn't say, <laughs> You, you two now come from where? John. Ah, right, right, right. You know, didn't John tell you long before he got arrested and put into prison to follow me? Where were you? Look at your former friends, you see? Where's Andrew, Andrew? <laughs> Andrew is also not around. He went to preach already. Now Jesus is alone in this time. Jesus received them. And let them have a taste of his great power, of his great truth. And say, I tell you something, you don't have to speak anything by way of exaggeration for me. No embellishment from you, please. But just tell what you heard and what you have seen. You know, we don't need any sales talk. Tomorrow, I have to spend the whole day teaching one of our churches how to evangelize. Now, what am I going to say? I was wondering, why do they want a seminar on what to evangelize? Is it not simple? Just go and tell everybody Jesus loves sinners. Repent. Why should I have a seminar? And they not only want seminar, I'm not complaining about them. They also want me to give them workshop. I said, what's that? Workshop. I said, how to do workshop? Uh, give us some scenario where, you know, some people refuse to accept uh, the gospel. And, uh, and I was laughing since then when I think about it. It's very simple. Jesus said, if you go somewhere and don't, anybody don't receive the gospel, shake off the dust of your feet and leave, right? Don't sit there and argue, no point. You present the gospel, the conviction part is the Spirit's work, not your part. Just present the gospel and move on. You don't have to sit there and show that you are clever, a philosopher, and argue. So I think tomorrow's workshop will finish very fast. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they won't be disappointed with me. What a wonderful Savior he is. No one who comes to him, no matter how great a doubter he would be, 
would go away without being comforted, fed, nourished, and equipped. I like to pray to the Lord for all of you here that you will hear the words of Christ telling you, go and witness what you have heard, what you have seen. I don't think John the Baptizer could have a better end than this because he came to prepare the way for Christ. He came to die for Christ. And now he's waiting for that moment of death. It will soon come. In that prison, he had no more opportunity to come out and witness. But he is going to be grateful to the Lord for allowing him to give one more chance to send in these two disciples who are still lingering around him and get equipped by the Lord. So he can now go to be with the Father in heaven knowing that even these souls that stick around him has now found Christ. So when they go back and tell John, John will be delighted. Wow! Thank God. You also found my Savior. And you can now tell me, instead of me telling you, who is Jesus, the Savior. You know, my dear friends, that's my prayer for this congregation. Before I die, or I move away from this place, if God so will, I will see bold witnesses of Jesus Christ rising from this congregation. If this congregation cannot continually have preachers, cannot have missionaries, cannot have bold witnesses of Christ in our midst, my preaching was in vain. And I plead with you, go to Christ today. Read the Bible every day. Pray to Him every day. Have communion with Him. Sweet communion with Him. You shall see the glory of Christ. Now, last few days, I preached on the excellencies of Christ. And the 50 of our people who gathered there, I pray for them that they will behold Christ in their heart, that Paul prayed for the Ephesians that their eyes of their understanding will be enlightened, that they may be filled with the knowledge of the exceeding riches of Christ. That's my prayer for you. Please make sure you are not offended in Christ, that you cannot go to Him. You, please make sure you are not offended that you will rather spend time with the world, listening to the world's music, listening to the world's entertainment, than with Christ. Go to Jesus. Let him tell you, may your pleasure be in me. May your heart be so thrilled about me that now you tell others, even a preacher like John, and let them rejoice. My joy is not just that Jesus is preached through my effort, but that Jesus is preached everywhere by all his people, even you, my dear brethren. May our church be a witnessing church, knowing Christ, being sure, declaring him, never shy about Christ, never showing any, any sign of offense in Christ but rather joy, satisfaction, and greatest pleasure in Christ. That's our calling. That's why we are a church. All built up, nourished up, growing, declaring Christ. Let us arise and sing our final hymn.